Well, you remember last week, we learned that uh, we, we were studying Galatians 1. And we learned that Paul was giving his credibility as an apostle because people were trying to discredit him in what he said. These people were the Judaizers who said that we need to be circumcised first and then follow the, Mo the Mosaic Covenant and then become Christians in order to be saved. They're saying that he just got his stuff from the apostles, that he wasn't an apostle himself, and that he was distorting the gospel. But we learned that he wasn't a puppet of the apostles, he was an apostle. That his message was independent and it actually came from God. But this week we're also, now we're going to learn about Galatians 2. We're going to look at the first half of Galatians 2, verses 1 through 10. And we're going to show that he wasn't just a pup, he wasn't a puppet of the apostles, but he was an apostle, and he was speaking the same message as the other apostles. Let's start off with Galatians 2, verses 1 through 2. We're going to dissect this passage. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with, the Bar with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, a gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. This happened probably around the time of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. It was about the right time frame, 14 years after his conversion. And Paul was going up there by a revelation from God. First, first off, he, he wanted, even though he knew he was right, he wanted to go to Jerusalem and, for the support of the Jerusalem apostles and to end this false teaching once and for all. He also just didn't want to divide the church. He wanted to make sure that the apostles weren't preaching some different doctrine. Let's, go, let's look at uh, Galatians 2, verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. You see, Titus was not forced to be circumcised. He didn't have to follow the Mosaic ordinances of the law. He wasn't forced to do that when he was brought before the apostles. This was the first dent in what the Judaizers were saying. They, this was the first evidence that Christians don't need to be circumcised in order to be saved. This shows, first off, the freedom in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 4 through 5. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in, in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us again into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. False brothers, these again were the Judaizers. See, all throughout Paul's ministry, these false teachers would come up and try to destroy what Paul was trying to do. We see that time and time again when he went into when he went into Galatia, this happened. When he went into Ephesus, this happened. In Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, he mentions this for a brief moment. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish everyone with tears. This happens today, doesn't it? We have a lot, we, we go into ministry, we preach the gospel, we're preaching we're preaching grace, we're preaching the truth in Jesus Christ, and people come up and they say, no, no, you have to also do good works in order to be saved. Not as an evidence showing that you're saved, but to be saved. We see that 
Um, some people teach, well, I have to, yeah, Jesus helps, Jesus sacrifice helps, but now I have to pay indulgences or do good works in order to be saved or in order, in order to get out of purgatory, stuff like that. But this is what we have to come back to, is the unity of the apostles. We can't just go off our own authority. We have to go back to the unity of the gospel and of the authenticity of the word. Did you know that the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years from the time of Moses to the time of the apostles in the first century. Forty different authors. And you know what? All of them agreed on God. All of them agreed on politics. All of them agreed on philosophy. I bet you couldn't even get five people from the same town who are of the same gender or of the same age to have the exact same opinion on everything. But this is what the Bible does. It has been written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors. And they all have the same opinion. They're all speaking the same thing. Granted, there's a revelation in the Bible that we learn more and more about God and about salvation as the Bible progresses from the Old Testament to the New Testament, all pointing to one thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. That He died on the cross and that He rose from the dead. And that we're saved by grace through faith. Let's look at the next verse, Galatians 2, verse 5. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. See, this was a fierce battle. One side was saying, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved, and follow the laws of Moses, live a legalistic lifestyle, follow the Talmud, and believe in Jesus. And there's the other side saying, no, Jesus died on the cross so we can be saved by faith in Him. So what were the apostles going to do? What were the Jerusalem apostles going to do? Were they going to give in to this legalistic attitude that comes from their own people, the Jews? Or are they going to go to what Apostle Paul was saying and what Jesus was saying what God was saying. Well, let's look at verse 6. And those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. They had nothing to add to the gospel. Those who seemed influential, referring to Peter, James, and John, the people that the Judaizers looked up to, people that they said, well, we are from the Jerusalem church and we are teaching that you have to follow the Torah and, and just the Torah and Jesus. He's, that's, what the pe that's what those people looked to was Peter, James, and John. They had nothing to add to the gospel. They did not say anything in the Judaizers' favor. This this, this totally destroyed the Judaizers' argument. This showed the credibility of Paul's message, that it was also indeed from, that it was indeed from God. That even though he wasn't taught by the apostles, that he received this message from God through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and they see these apostles equal compared to, or equal to Paul. They're equal to the rest of the believers. They weren't better than anyone else. They weren't glorified holy people. They were normal, average, every ordinary, everyday men who were sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
that the Holy Spirit was influential in their ministries. Same as Paul. For God shows no partiality. He doesn't show favoritism. Let's look at verses 7 through 8. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted to the gospel to the, circum to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through, through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. They saw that Paul had the Holy Spirit working in him. This is quite astounding. This proves, the this proves the credibility of this message. This proves that this letter that we received in Galatians is influenced by the Holy Spirit. That the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was actually written by Him through these men. They accepted His message. They saw who His mission was to the, the uncircumcised. He saw that he would be really influential to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles. And they know what their mission was to. They knew their mission was to Jerusalem and to the Jews there. Look at the next, next two verses. When James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, everything I was eager to do. These people who seemed to be pillars in the Judaizers' eyes gave the right hand of fellowship to Paul. They recognized him as an apostle. They recognized him as the one who was working through him. That the Holy Spirit was working through him. They recognized Barnabas was also an apostle. And that they were to be missionaries to the Gentiles. That really shows a need for missions, doesn't it? It really shows that we need to go out there and proclaim the gospel to those who haven't heard it before. And that's that's the thing. We need to be preaching it. We need to be proclaiming it. The right hand of fellowship was something that they, that in that culture, it was like, you are as equal status to me. And referring to poor, what does that mean? Well, they were probably talking about the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Paul did a number of offerings in the church to help the poor in Jerusalem. One thing we, uh, one verse that we see him doing this is Romans five. 25 to 26. At, the, at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribu contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. This is a really important thing. We need to remember the poor. We need to be able to help each other in times of need. That's what the whole, all the, the whole early church was about. That's what they were doing. They were helping the poor. They're helping the orphans, helping the widows. They were giving need to the brothers and sisters who desperately needed. Now, that's what the tithe and offering is for. It's also to help. It's to help the church. It's to help the people in the church, and it's to help missions. It's to help everything. So what do we take take away from this? Well, number one, Paul wasn't teaching a different gospel from the rest of the apostles. He was speaking from God, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. See, how we apply this today is while we're going, and people are attacking us, and people are attacking our message, we need to be able to defend it. We need to be able to preach it and proclaim it. This is evidence showing that our message is true, that there was unity in the church. There might not be a unit, so much unity in the church now. We have different denominations and different 
people following different creeds, but let's all band together on the gospel. Let's all band together on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That He died and that He and that He rose again. Now, anyone who believes in Him will be saved. Let's proclaim this gospel message. Here, here's the gospel message to those who don't know who, don't know what it is. See, God, who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, is good and just. He's just God. And He's judge. So it's, so it's really bad news that we have sinned against Him and we deserve to go to hell. It's bad news. But here's good news. He and God in His mercy sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that anyone who believes in Him will be saved. died on the cross and rose from the dead. So anyone who believes in Him will be saved. He became a sin offering for us. What we need to do in response to that is we need to turn from our lifestyle of sin and submit to Christ. Follow His ways. Do what He wants us to do. And then we need to be baptized so that, to show that we have died to our former way of life and that we are resurrected in newness of life in Jesus Christ. It's very, very important stuff. I urge you who don't believe in this to turn to Christ. And to those who are in Christ, I recommend that you proclaim this message because no one can be saved unless they hear the good news through the preaching of God's Word. They, they can't be saved unless they hear the good news. It's in the Bible, guys. Just please consider this. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your holy word and our study of Galatians. Um, I ask that you just keep help helping us to dissect your word and to be able to preach the truth that is in it, be able to learn from it, be able to defend it, and claim it all throughout the, the entire world, starting where we're at. And Lord, I ask that um, you just help us to remember the poor and remember our, our duty as Christians to help, to help others. And uh, just help us all to live in unity among, amongst each other to be founded on the good news of Jesus Christ. And bring all this before you. In the name of Jesus Christ's name. Amen.